Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Public Works Association's Click, Listen, and Learn Conference Center. Today's Click, Listen, and Learn broadcast is titled, Self-Assessment Equals Accreditation, and is brought to you by APWA's Accreditation Council. Please do not share your instructions for today's program. If you are using, if you are using shared instructions, please disconnect immediately so that registered attendees can access the program. A recording of today's program will be available in the APWA members library within one week. APWA members can log into the library to access content free of charge. My name is Stephen Miller, and I will be your moderator today. I'm currently an accreditation manager with APWA. I've previously been a civil engineer with 12 plus years experience in public works agencies and another seven in the private sector. Stormwater management has long been my passion, but asset management has more recently become a focus of my career. I have a BS in civil engineering from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and I'm a licensed professional engineer in the states of Kansas and Missouri. Today's program is worth 0 0.2 continuing education credits. To request CEUs, participants must complete the survey. The link to the survey is included in your program instructions. CEUs for the Click, Listen, and Learn programs are typically processed within 10 business days. Today's session is interactive, so if you have questions for our speakers, please type them into the question pod on the bottom of your screen. You may do this at any time throughout the program. We would like to begin with some interactive questions, the first of which you see on your screen now. Use your mouse to click on the button next to the answer you want to choose. If you're in full screen mode, you will need to minimize the screen to answer the question. So our first question, how many people are participating at your site today? A, one, B, two to three, C, four to seven, D, eight to 20, all one agency, E, eight to 20, multiple agencies, and F, more than 21. We'll give just a, a minute to get the responses in. They're coming in, and uh, looks like the vast majority of, the, of you are sitting solo at your computer, so we're glad to have you all here today. Our second question is, what is the population of your agency's jurisdiction? Up to 25,000, 25,000 to 50,000, 50 to 100,000, 100 to 250,000, 250 to a million, or a million plus. And we have quick voters, that's good. And uh, wow, we're really spread out all over the map, but uh, it looks like uh, uh, with a grand total of four vo votes, up to 25,000 is the leader. And then we've got a couple tied at, at uh, several tied at three, and uh, even a couple more than a million, that's great. All right, thank you for answering those questions. Please join us after today's program to continue the conversation through the Accreditation Council InfoNow community on APWA Connect. Instructions on accessing the Connect communities are available in the files pod at the bottom of your screen. And now it's time to introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is Tracy Quintana. Tracy is the Accreditation Manager at the American Public Works Association. Tracy's responsibilities focus on guiding and assisting agencies through the accreditation process, evaluator recruitment and training, accreditation workshops and outreach, and self-assessment software support. Prior to joining APWA, Tracy spent 18 years as a Public Works Executive Assistant with the City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Tracy has a Bachelor of Science in Management from Hodges University. While in Florida, she was an active member of the APWA Florida chapter and served as the Southwest Florida Branch Chair. APA is delighted to bring you such knowledge and experience. 
To read more about our speakers, please go to the education page of the APWA website. Tracy, would you like to start your presentation? Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. I'm looking forward to today's conversation and hope that we have some great questions being asked. I, we're going to get started here in just a minute. So in the meantime, I want you to start thinking about what your questions are. As we are preparing to get started here, hang on just a second. A little bit of technical difficulties on my end. All right, here we go. So let's start again. Good morning, everybody. We're here in Kansas City today. I know that I've had the opportunity to talk to some of y'all before when I've been on the road, so I'm glad to tell you that I'm finally back in KC and have been speaking to, I know, some that have come join the call, and I hope that we're uh, able to answer your questions today, make you feel more comfortable with your decision to pursue self-assessment leading to accreditation. But most important, I want you to know what your resources are. So let's go ahead and get started. Everybody's got busy days, and we have a lot of information to cover in a little amount of time. One of the reasons what we're here for today is we're going to provide you with a clearer understanding of what exactly is the self-assessment and accreditation process. It's a little bit more involved than what some of you might think it is, but it's easier to take on than what you might think it is. We're going to also talk about how public works agencies are actually using the self-assessment process in a day-to-day -day environment as they're working to improve their operations. The most popular question, the most in-demand question, I should say, is how do we get started with the self-assessment process? What do we have to do? And how long is it going to take to complete the process? So all of those questions plus more are going to be talked about this morning as we're going through this program. Let's get started. Why do you want to use self-assessment? Well, our professionals in the public works industry have prepared a very dynamic explanation of what exactly is self-assessment. The systematic and comprehensive comparison of your agency's existing policies and practices with those that are used in the manual. Now you're going to get a better understanding of what the Public Works Management Practices Manual is later on here. But for the time being, what I want you to think about is what is self-assessment? Self for me, when I think about self-assessment, what that equals to, it's all about the process for improving, improving what your agency does, how they think about how they're performing their jobs, and where can you improve upon. It's an opportunity to learn about what other agencies are doing that maybe are very successful in the same endeavors and responsibilities that you have undertaken. It's providing you with the guidelines to review your existing policies and procedures. As public works professionals, we all know that we're doers. We're out there in the field. We're taking care of our communities to make them an area that people want to come and live in. They want to run their businesses out of. They want to raise their families. So public works professionals such as yourself, that's what you do. You make the community a place that draws others in. However, normally public works professionals are not the strongest in developing and maintaining documentation. And I say that as one that knows best. I've been through it. I've done it. We want to help you, though, with the self-assessment process, become more comfortable in actually documenting what your policies and procedures are, documenting and reviewing those same policies and procedures on a regular basis. As we get caught up in our day-to-day -day activities, we also tend to have tunnel vision, and you focus in strictly on what it is that your task is for the day or for the week, whatever your assignment may be. It's important to re remember, though, that as an agency in the public works industry, you're not all alone. This is the opportunity to build upon that, create stronger teams by utilizing 
all of your staff within your agency. And self-assessment is also the first step, the first required step, to become accredited. We're going to talk more about all of these reasons and what is self-assessment as we go through the program here today. Your agency has a lot of opportunities that it can gain from completing the self-assessment process. As you're looking at your existing policies and procedures, you'll be able to identify what it is that you're doing well. You may know that right off the bat because it's something that you've done over and over again. But with that same thinking, can it be improved upon? You may have staff, your boots on the ground people that are out there and they're implementing those procedures, but they may have an idea that can shorten the length of time. Maybe it will make save money on fuel. Whatever it is involved, you have people that are actively following your procedures, implementing the policies. Those are the ones that you want to build upon. Ask them, can it be done better? Do you have ideas for improvements? This is involving your employees in what we refer to as continuous improvement. Being public works professionals means you have to grow with the times. You have to look at the technology that's out there. The self-assessment process will help you recognize where the improvements are needed, where the pr improvements may not be necessary. You may even find that you are doing processes that no longer need to be done. We want to help you organize and prioritize your areas where the improvement is needed. There's no need for you to reinvent the wheel. Through this self-assessment process, utilizing the manual and the tools that APWA helps has helped prepare for you will help make this even more possible. It is definitely a goal that is attainable. You just have to think in terms of there is not one single person that can do this. It is intended to be a group effort. Hence, it pulls upon your team building uh, capabilities. The other thing that we face as a challenge daily, I know, is you know making sure that our community is satisfied. How many times have you received a phone call from a resident or you've been stopped while you're out on the street asking why it is that you're doing something? Surely you can do it in a more efficient manner. By completing the self-assessment process and looking at all of your processes that are in place, you are able to then verify, you have verified that what you're doing is in the best for the community. And you can reassure your residents, you can reassure your council members, your administrator, your city manager, anybody that questions why you're doing something, you can reassure them through completing the self-assessment that you have made sure what you're doing is valid, that it's cost effective, and it's responsive. Those are very important these days when we know that all eyes are on you no matter where it is you are in the community. The other gain that you'll have complete with the self-assessment process is developing a strategic plan. Now I know that many of you probably already have an organization strategic plan. But think about that. Your organizational strategic plan focuses on every department as a whole. How do each of your departments contribute to a well-run organization? We want you to take it one step further. Take those items that are in strategic plan that focus on public works and expand upon them. This is your opportunity to think big. What are your department's goals and performances measures? What is it that you want to look closely at? Your agency strategic plan does not have to be an extensive document. Addressing what your goals and performance measures are, making sure that they still align with your agency strategic, with your organization's strategic plan. Sorry about that. Making sure everything aligns is key, but focusing on, as a sole department, how it is that you can improve and continue providing upstanding service to your community is key. So you will have to have a strategic plan as part of the self-assessment process. I want to make sure that everybody is clear on that so there are no surprises 
once you start that actual self-assessment process. As we move forward and start talking about what exactly is self-assessment, I want you to keep an open mind. And remember, every agency that tackles the self-assessment process will take it on in a different manner. No two agencies do it alike, but you all have the same end result to be the best that you can be. Stephen, do you want to talk about the manual? Thank you, Tracy. The Bible. Thank you, Tracy. The Bible of Accreditation is the Public Works Management Practices Manual. We're currently under the 8th edition, with the 9th edition to be published later this year. When you, sub when you submit your application for accreditation determines which edition you will use. This is an important point, because if you start self-assessment with one version, but apply under a later version, you will have to update your work accordingly. Generally, there aren't wholesale changes to the manual, so even if you were to get caught in such a scenario, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but you obviously don't want to create extra work for yourself and your staff. Once you apply, you will have 18 months to complete the process, so if it looks like you're running up against a new manual publication, you should strongly consider getting that application in ASAP. Now let's talk a little nomenclature. Agency, that's you, the body undertaking self-assessment or accreditation. The agency isn't necessarily your entire organization. Uh, we'll talk about, in fact, I'm going to skip down to number three. Organization is going to be the village, town, city, county, or whatever organizational structure you're under. Uh, your agency may be only one part of that larger overall overall organization. Uh, for instance, uh, your city may have a, a utilities department uh, that is responsible for some aspects of the manual, a public works department that's responsible for the others. Each of those agencies can be accredited individually. So if you're just the public works department and you're applying on your own, that's going to be the sole agency we're looking at. And then, of course, the governing body, I think that's fairly self-explanatory, the elected or appointed body that, that you uh, report to. Some other key definitions, routine activities are things that are, uh, you are annual or biannual review or reporting periods. Periodic are uh, items that have a review cycle of at least three years. Now, these next two, jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional, are very important. Uh, right off the bat, as you start the self-assessment uh, process, you're going to need to determine which parts of the manual are applicable to you. It's a truly a rare organization that will be responsible for all 609 practices. For instance, in the city I used to work for, the parks, which are covered under Chapter 19 of this manual, we're all taken care of by the county. So for that city, any practice directly related to parks was considered not applicable or, or non-jurisdictional when they applied for accreditation. Now, Chapter 19 also covers forestry, and in that particular city, uh, the street trees were the city responsibility. So some, but not all, of Chapter 19 was applicable to them. Uh, a little statistic, on average, our accredited agencies have been responsible for 402 practices, with the smallest being 75 and the largest being 556. So what is it which you're actually going to do once you start delving into the manual? Well, let's look at an example. Chapter 4 covers finance. And as you can see, as you look at each practice, you will see some bold blue text. The blue text is the practice. Right below that is some explanatory text in black. This is your plain English description of what is expected for the practice. So in this particular case, budget preparation responsibilities should specify the procedure to prepare the budget, the way it is presented, 
and who will conduct its preparation and presentation. So for this particular practice case, what would you need to do? It's likely you would supply a, an SOP, a standard operating procedure, a policy, or perhaps even an ordinance or section of code. However, it is however your agency designates these responsibilities and processes, which is what you'll need to provide. All right, so I see we already have a question that's received. Let's go ahead from Jennifer. What is the anticipated date for the next manual? Well, the manual is scheduled to be, the ninth edition is scheduled to be released at PWX later this month. It will be available through the bookstore in September, followed by then the self-assessment software will be available um, at the same time. If your agency is not under contract for the eighth edition, and that means if you have not applied for your first time accreditation by October 15th, you will need to move up to the ninth edition prior to applying for accreditation. So that means, Jennifer, if your agency, you've already started working on the eighth edition, and this is the edition that you wish to apply for and achieve accreditation under for your first time, your agency should consider submitting their application to and a, a, application and agreement under the 8th edition to APWA to be received by October 15th. Otherwise, what you'll have to do is you will at some point need to move up to the 9th edition prior to putting in your application. I hope that answers your question. The ninth edition also, as I mentioned, um, it's going to be coming out at PWX. So you'll be able to, um, when we come back, it will be available through the bookstore. You can also purchase the software conversion for it. Let's go ahead and let's start talking about actually getting started with the self-assessment process. I know that one of the hardest things to take on is getting started. It's, it's just a way of life. Everybody dreads the thought of something new. We're going to try and make it as easy as possible for you. So sit back and get comfortable. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Uh, so right off the bat, what do we need for you to be successful? Committed leadership. And uh, I'm, I'm taking a guess that most of our listeners today are in a position of leadership. Uh, directors, potential accreditation managers, maybe even some city managers uh, or county commissioners or, or uh, city council members. Uh, but committed uh, leadership is, is vitally important. After that, you're going to need highly engaged employees. And I hope that uh, all of your employees just naturally gravitate toward doing this type of thing and dig right on in. Uh, and if they don't, well, you're going to have to provide them a little bit of motivation, but uh, I, I have confidence that you'll be able to do that. Uh, the next thing you're really going to have to have to be successful is an organized system of documentation, policies, procedures, and practices. Uh, and, and if you think that you don't have that right now, well, let me tell you, self-assessment and accreditation will help you get there. And lastly, accreditation and self-assessment is all about the commitment to improve. And quite frankly, that is why all of us are here today. So for our leadership, um, if you have mid-level managers that think accreditation is the most important thing in the world, but you as a director don't care, then guess what? It's going to be tough to succeed. Even if the director is committed, or the superintendent is committed. If, if the city manager or, or the county board doesn't support it, it's going to be tough to succeed. And credit, accreditation is all about wanting the agency to be its best. This requires top-down commitment, and it really is all about the culture of the organization and every position and every process of the agency. So again, Going back a little bit, first thing that you're going to do as the director and the accreditation managers 
is to begin by reviewing uh, the 40 chapters in the manual. As I, I think I said before, currently 609 practices under the 8th edition in 40 chapters Sit down, determine which of those practices are jurisdictional or applicable to your agency. Once you've done that, you can start developing your teams. Um, you're obviously you're going to have your mid-level managers, your frontline uh, employees, higher level managers. But pretty much most everybody's going to be involved at some point. Uh, it may just simply be in going and asking a, a, a quick question of a field employee, how and why do you do a certain thing, or it may be talking to somebody about some very sophisticated processes that require ordinances to enact and so on. So as a leader, you're dedicated and your boss is bought in. Now you need to pull in all the ground troops. Uh, you can't just delegate and say do it. Accreditation takes work, work that isn't regularly scheduled. Your managers and your staff are going to need your direction and support to effectively do their regular jobs. In addition, some of this information may need to come from departments outside of your manager's control. This is where good communication and leadership from you will be vital. If you're in the Public Works Department and you need information on your uh, human resources policies, you're going to probably need to talk to that human resources director and, and get your lower managers to communicate with each other and provide each other the information that they need. And I'm going to go out there on a limb and say you may have one or more employees that aren't going to fully buy into this process. Uh, we at APWA refer to those people as friendlies. Someone who smiles and nods when you talk about accreditation but is really thinking, oh my goodness, this is stupid, or I don't have time for this. How are you going to handle those folks? The best way is to get them involved in showing them how accreditation can back up what they do, and why and how their job is important. And if there are problems, give them the opportunity to come up with the solutions through the self-assessment process. And I have confidence that you'll be able to do that. So finally, as I said before, self-assessment and accreditation is a commitment to improvement. And, and to improve, Sometimes you have to you sometimes you have to change. You have to be willing to accept changes. Sometimes you're going to be challenged on what you do. And those challenges, you might be able to meet them head on and and refute them. You might again have to take a step back and say, "Yeah, it's time we we make a change." But be respectful of that. It's all about trying to find a better way to do things. Again, don't be confrontational. This is not a contest, it's, it's an improvement process. It should give you the opportunity to ask the questions, what are we doing right, what can we do better, and ultimately see the fruits of going through that work. Tracy? As we've been going forward through this, Stephen was, as he was talking about the manual, we received a couple of more questions, and so what I want to We've had the question, how often are the new editions published? Every three years we start looking, and when I say we, we have our accreditation council and a team compiled of representatives from accredited agencies will do a manual review of the current edition. So on an average, we look at releasing a new manual every three years. That plays right in line with agencies that have achieved accreditation because reaccreditation is required every four years. So this way, when you've achieved accreditation and you're moving through four years, you'll move up to the next edition that's in line. We also have software that goes with the, with the Public Works Management Practices Manual. That software is updated at the same time as the new edition is released. So yes, the software will be available, not at PWX, but in September after we return and release it through the bookstore. Good questions, everybody. Keep them coming. 
As we talk about how you start with the self-assessment process and move forward and getting everybody on board with it, we have a couple of tips for you to help make it a smoother transition, helping everybody buy into the process and be successful for your agency. The most important thing to remember is communication. Those people that are involved and understand what's going on and are kept apprised of any new deadlines or timelines, milestones that have been achieved, will be quicker to jump on board and be a part of the success. Also, be sure to keep priority focus on what it is you want to accomplish. You can do that by setting deadlines. People by nature are procrastinators. I'm no different. I'm sure that some of y'all are no different. By having deadlines, though, and maintaining those deadlines, you can assure that your goals are met in a timely manner. The one thing to remember is that your clock officially does not start ticking with APWA until you submit your application for accreditation. Once your application is submitted, APWA requires that you complete the self-assessment and have your accreditation site visit scheduled within three years. On an average, it takes an agency 15 to 18 months to complete that self-assessment process and get ready for their site visit. That's an average number. It is not something that your agency is locked in stone on. You want to make sh be sure to show the benefits to your staff and to your management as to why you're taking on the self-assessment process. That way, everybody has a clear understanding of what is expected of them. Maintaining that upper-level support, as Stephen mentioned, is key. You want to have their support. It's instrumental in your success. And conduct the training sessions. Similar to what we're doing here today, you have other opportunities available to you and your staff. We offer a self-assessment software training that can be done over the phone. It's a great opportunity for everybody that might be utilizing the software to hear the same helpful hints, get a demonstration of how it's utilized all at the same time. We also can do training on how to understand what exactly the practices are asking for. That is important in order so that you don't have somebody reading it one way and totally missing the fact that they need to pay attention to the content that is in blue, as Stephen was mentioning. Some questions are continuing to come in. Non-jurisdictional. If you have a contract for a service, what you have to do is if you are responsible for maintaining, managing that contract, and I'm going to use solid waste as an example. If solid waste is a service that's contracted out for your community, but your agency manages the contract, then yes, that is likely that the chapter will be applicable on solid waste collection and also on um, recycling. The one chapter that may not be applicable in terms of solid waste is disposal, and that has a lot to do with landfill. What you'll want to do is take a look at all of the practices within the chapter. Remember, you may come across chapters that you are not responsible for based on what the title of the chapter is, but there may be some level of responsibility within a practice or two. So be sure to pay close attention to those chapters that you are deeming non-jurisdictional. There may still be practices that apply to you. And again, if you have a contract for a service and your agency manages that contract, it is likely going to be an applicable chapter. The accreditation manager, along with the director, are vital to every agency going through the self-assessment process. Your director, obviously, is the one that's going to be reviewing all of your practices and approving them. Your accreditation manager, Think of that person as your own personal cheerleader, your own personal timekeeper. They're going to be the person that is going to be making sure you stay on top of your deadlines, that they will respond to any questions you have. They're going to be the main point of contact for us back here at APWA. 
That doesn't mean, though, however, that you yourself cannot reach out to Stephen or I if you have a question as you're working through the self-assessment. Your accreditation manager often will be the person that's assigning chapters to you in the software. They will be coordinating all of the uh, site visit schedule arrangements. Like I said, they're going to be our point of contact. They will be your lead person overseeing the process. At the 2018 SNOW conference, at this time, the question that I, that's come across is, will there be an accreditation uh, class at the SNOW conference in 2018? It's a good suggestion. At this time, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but it is something that we can certainly consider. So stay tuned on that and watch for more news coming out after PWX about the, the SNOW conference. Another question that's come in, can you start the self-assessment process prior to submitting your application? Most definitely, and we see a lot of agencies that are doing that. You can start on the self-assessment process at any time. There is no timeline, no clock ticking at that point. You only The only time that clock starts ticking is when you've submitted your application. We have some agencies that will start the self-assessment process and submit their application all within a very short time of each other only because they're using it as a motivational tool for their staff. They're able to say to their staff, we are doing this, we have three years to complete it, however, you want to try and complete it in less time. Other times agencies will wait until they're a percentage, maybe 50% through the self-assessment process to have a better idea of when they might be ready for their site visit. This is a great opportunity to use it as a budgeting tool at the same time. Because remember, when you submit your application, then you will have the opportunity to submit your accreditation fees over the course of 18 months. 50% at the time of your initial submittal, the remaining balance is due within 18 months or prior to your site visit, whichever comes first. For those of you that have recently purchased the 8th edition manual and software, maybe you've purchased it very recently. Don't worry, we are here at APWA to work with you. Then You still have a lot of opportunities available to you. If your agency is just getting started, maybe you're not sure when you want to consider you know, putting in your application for accreditation. Please reach out to Stephen or I here at APWA and let's talk about what the options are available to you with the release of the ninth edition coming out later this month. I don't want anybody to feel frustrated because a new manual is coming out. Keep in mind the new manual is going through introducing a new chapter and it's intended, like y'all, is to move forward with a continuous improvement. We want to make sure that we're always bringing you the most up-to-date information in the industry. That's why we look at our manual every three years. So please, again, reach out to Stephen or I, and let's talk about what your options are if you've recently purchased the 8th edition manual and software. All right, so let's keep moving forward. As you're working through the self-assessment process and you want to be successful, we have today 128 agencies out there that have achieved accreditation. On an average, that's approximately 9,100 public works employees that have experienced in one form or another the self-assessment process. Quite a networking tool. You have all of those agencies that are more than willing to help you out they want to give you their own ideas. They'll share with you their experiences, the good and the bad. They may even be willing to share with you some examples of what they have done in their practices. Be sure to prioritize your plan. Set those deadlines. When do you want to formally start the self-assessment process? When do you want to be completed? Do you have an idea in mind? As always, though, we know in public works that things happen. 
you may experience a natural disaster, which I certainly hope does not happen to you, but things happen, and you may experience a delay. If that does occur, just be sure to pick up the pieces and start again. Encourage your employees to always at some point, once a week maybe, make sure they're looking at their practices and touching it. We find that staff that put it to the side and don't look at it at least once a week are those that you can expect to really procrastinate and be delayed on meeting deadlines. Reward and celebrate those milestones that you have met. And then keep it simple. When you are looking at your policies and procedures, it's key to keep this in mind. The person that is actually going to be reading those may not have the year's experience in public works that you do. It may be that person that's just been hired fresh out of high school. This is their first job, their first experience with public works. If they look at your SOP manual, will they understand what it is that you are trying to say in your policy? Will they be able to follow the procedure and go out and take on the task assigned to them? Keep it simple. If you use acronyms in your description, make sure you clarify what those acronyms stand for. Keep it, you know, again, keep it simple. No policy or procedure has to equal that of a short novel. It needs to cover the basis, make sure that your staff is understanding, and make sure also that it is a true testimony to what it is that you are doing. <clears throat> As you're working and preparing for self-assessment, working through the self-assessment, leading up to accreditation, there's those questions that come about. What does it cost? How long is it going to take? You have a couple of questions that do, a couple of items that do come up right at the beginning. Related to cost, you're going to want to purchase at least one manual, and you'll want to purchase the self-assessment software. On that software, you can utilize and add as many people as you want from your agency. Every person that's going to be working on the self-assessment process should, I recommend, be given a login to the software. We're going to talk in more detail in a few minutes about that software, so keep it, you know, heads up, it's coming. I've got some uh, behind the scenes um, sh secrets to share with y'all. The cost to purchase one manual and software is $130. If you wish to purchase additional manuals, those are an option available to you through the bookstore. But again, remember, you only have to make one purchase on the software. Then after you've achieved accreditation, every four years going through reaccreditation, there is a conversion software to purchase, but it's a minimal expense. You're going to also have to think about what the cost of the accreditation fees are. Those fees will be calculated based on an application that we'll be looking at here shortly. But included in the cost is, in the formula is what your population is, how many chapters are applicable to you, and then also a flat fee for the first nine chapters which are mandatory. And I'll talk about those in a minute also. Keep in mind what your workload is. We know that you're going to have to continue with your day-to-day -day activities. How are you going to balance overseeing and reviewing these additional chapters and practices within? Don't plan on doing it all at the one time. This is definitely a slow and steady process. Take the time to make sure that you are looking at all of your material. Is it current? Does it still pertain to what we're doing? Do we even still do the process? And maintain your momentum. Remember, that person that procrastinates is likely going to be the person that misses deadlines and will be the one person your accreditation manager is having to stand over their shoulder and remind them that they've got to get their reviews done. Work with your team. Keep everybody apprised of the progress or maybe the challenges that you're facing. This is not intended for a one-person task. This is a team effort. If you're struggling with somewhere, 
it's likely that someone else may have the same struggle and have found a solution. You have numerous tools available to you as you're going through the self-assessment process. Outside assistance, remember I mentioned there's 128 agencies accredited today. You have those staff that have been through the experience. Additionally, from our accredited agencies, we've compiled a team of evaluators. Those evaluators are available to do peer reviews for agencies preparing for their accreditation site visit. They can come on site. Hopefully you have somebody that's locally or within driving distance to you. They can come on site and do a peer review where they will look over random practices as if they were doing a site visit evaluation and let you know, you know, is this practice meeting, are your supporting documentation meeting what the practice is asking for? The other tool we have available is the accreditation news group. This is called the Accreditation InfoNow Community. Agencies that are accredited and under contract or going through the process have the option to reach out to this email community and ask questions about, you know, maybe how did they address certain practices? What did they, do they have verbiage that they could view for a developing a policy or procedure? So again, you have the use of this accreditation community. The APWA website leading to the accreditation page is a sort wealth of information. There are resources available on there. Contact information is provided to our agencies that are accredited or already under contract. And we also have our networking feature. Remember again, those 128 agencies create quite a group of networking that you can reach out to. Why do you want to document? There's no better way when you're reviewing your policies and procedures than to look at your look at those existing documents to determine is it a duplicate? Is this something that we used to do back in the 80s and we no longer do it? Is there continuous discussion about is this the right way to do it? So by having items in documentation you are creating that library of responses to questions you may periodically receive or you frequently get. I remember a time when we had a front end person answering our phones and if it wasn't for our SOP manual, she might not have been able to answer some of the questions. So she, by having your staff informed, knowing where to find the answers, they're able to answer questions not only from your residents, but also from your other staff on your agency and within your organization. One of the key components of going through the self-assessment process, though, is aiding you with succession planning. In a time when we witnessed over the past 10 years during the recession, when we were experiencing retirement from our employees, a lot of agencies were left with a unfulfilled legacy. What this means is you had that 30-year employee that retired. What if you didn't have documented what it was they were doing? They have all this industrial knowledge that they walk out the door and it goes with them. So by creating your SOPs and responding to the questions in the, in the manual, you are helping fulfill a legacy for these long-term employees. So when they leave, whether they've retired, whether they've won the lottery, for whatever reason, anybody that is ex trained can come in and continue the good work that those long-term em employees have begun. <coughs> Your policies and procedures should definitely be written. That does not mean that it has to actually be written down by hand on a piece of paper. Today with technology, we're all able to read our documents from our phones, from our iPads, from our laptops. Technology is amazing these days. But what you want to do is make sure that those policies and procedures are written in some format. We are not here to tell you how to write those. 
We just want to make sure that you recognize that policies and procedures can be provided in a various formats. Whether it's in the format of a memo or a letter, maybe it's a screenshot from software that you're using for your inventories. It can also be such as what the APWA self-assessment software is used for. It doesn't matter how you write these policies and procedures. Write it according to the needs of your agency and to the requirements of your organization. The one thing that we are not going to tell you is that you are doing something wrong. Our job as evaluators, as managers of the accreditation program, is to lead you through the process to make sure that you are documenting. Again, we are not telling you you are doing it wrong. We just want to make sure and help you document what it is that you do. When you're working through the self-assessment process, you're going to come across a compliance assessment. What does that mean? Does it mean that just because you've developed a policy or procedure that your compliances, your practices are all in full compliance? Not necessarily. Remember the term continuous improvement. That falls right in line with your compliance levels. As you're working through the self-assessment process, Keep these terms in mind, and we're going to start from the bottom and work our way up. Non-jurisdictional is the same as non-applicable. That means that it does not pertain to your agency. You do not take the lead on it. But remember, you must indicate why it doesn't apply to you, and if it applies to another agency, whether it's internally or externally, indicate who. Non-compliance. That could very well be a practice that is asking for a policy, a procedure, a study, an inventory, and you have neither. Maybe you don't have any procedures on what it is you have to do before uh, taking out a front-end loader for a job site. What type of safety checks do you do? Maybe you don't have a safety checklist. That would be, you would think of that as non-compliant knowing that you've got to develop something to meet the requirements of the practice. Partial compliance, that may very well be you have a safety checklist, but it is back from the 1980s. What's the key to look for on this? It's the date that that checklist was created. When was the last time you reviewed it? You want to make sure you are looking and reviewing your policies and procedures, your processes, your studies, your inventories, at least a minimum of every three years. So partial compliance could be you have something, but it's outdated, and you need to review it to see if it still is consistent and pertains to what you're doing. Substantial compliance. This means you have the material needed for the practice. However, maybe it is incomplete. An example of this might be in Chapter 19, which is Parks, Grounds, and Forestry. It asks for a tree inventory. And if you're in a state up in Illinois, Ohio, where they have tons of trees, Washington, Oregon, even over along the East Coast, and you have a large tree inventory, maybe you started your inventory last year, it's going to take you, though, on an average, you know, four to five years, maybe even longer, to really thoroughly complete a tree inventory. So this practice would be deemed substantial compliance because you have started it and it's a continuous work in progress. Full compliance is where exactly that. It's full compliance. Your policy, your procedure, it's current. It reflects a current review date your inventory is completed, whatever the practice is asking for, you are able to show everything that it needs. Now, as you're thinking ahead to accreditation, in order to have accreditation being recommended, all of your practices that apply to your agency must be in full or substantial compliance in order for that recommendation to be made to the accreditation council. So again, if you have practices that are in partial or non-compliance, 
at the time of your accreditation site visit, before recommendation can be made to accredit your agency, the practice would have to be at least substantial compliance. You can be accredited if all of your practices were in substantial compliance. I don't think that has ever happened, and I don't expect it to ever happen, but it can take place. Got a question here? Do you submit payment when submitting your application for accreditation? Yes, you have to submit at least 50% of the total accreditation fee. So then after you've submitted your application with that 50%, then what you'll do is you'll have 18 months, which brings you into another fiscal year in which you can then pay the remaining 50% balance. Or if your site visit takes place before that 18 months lapse, you have to pay your the remaining balance before your site visit. So either 18 months or prior to your site visit, whichever comes first is when you pay the balance. Now for agencies that have already been accredited and are working toward reaccreditation, your fees, which are 50% of the accreditation fee, can only be paid in one lump sum at the time of submitting your application. Another, co another question we've received, is there a cost to completing the self-assessment process? The only cost associated would be for purchasing the manual and the software. Or if you chose to have uh, staff come out and we can do a workshop directly for your agency. But that's a whole other discussion. So no, the only cost associated is with the purchase of the manual and the software. The accreditation fees are based on three areas on the application. Your population, a flat $800 fee, which is for the first nine chapters. Those chapters are mandatory for every agency. So there's a flat $800 fee. And then the third part of the formula is for the remaining 31 chapters, $200 per applicable chapter. You combine all three of those totals together and that gives you your accreditation fee. The self-assessment software is being updated at the same time as the manual. It will not be available though until September after the manual is released. So you can't order the software now, unfortunately. You do have to wait until the ninth edition comes out. Question that's been asked, what is the current cost of an application fee? Every agency is different. As I explained, it's based on your population, the $800 flat fee, and however many chapters are applicable. On an average, we're seeing about 15000 between twelve dollars and $15,000 for applications. Um, again, it can vary, though, on the size of your population. That has a big impact and how many chapters you're doing. Question, if you've already bought the book but did not receive the software, can you request the software? You can go online to the APWA bookstore and purchase the software. It's $50 standalone. Once you've made that purchase, then we receive an email and we'll generate a key code and send it to the person, to the director, so that the software key code can be activated. Your questions are great, by the way. Keep them coming. I hope that we're satisfactorily answering them for you. As you're preparing your application for accreditation, one thing you're going to want to look at is you may come across practices within a chapter that you can't talk about. You need to request a waiver. And maybe you can't talk about these practices because of labor agreements that maybe you've got labor discussions underway. Maybe there's a, a court, uh, go, court order in place, case law, or even legislation. If you have pending litigation, that's another reason. For whatever reason, if there is a practice that directly relates to any of those reasons for having a waiver, simply send in an email to me. Let me know you need a waiver on which particular practice and why. Once I receive that, we look it over, and then we it's reviewed, and then we'll notify you that your waiver has been granted. 
you would want to indicate on your application then at that point that you've requested a waiver and it has been approved. Waivers don't happen very often. An example of when a waiver may come into play that we see more frequently than not is in Chapter 2 for human resources uh, for agencies that ha are, have unions for their public works employees. Um, that may, there's a couple of practices that talk about unions, and so you may have to have a waiver for those. Or they may just be deemed not applicable because you don't have a union. So you've got two different options there. Once you've decided to take that commitment and move forward to the, to go through the self-assessment process, you have different strategies that will come into play to determine your progress in the process. You're going to make the first initial round of going through looking at the chapters and determining which practices pertain to your agency and which do not. And remember, if you take the lead on a responsibility, then you're going to want to make sure that that is an applicable practice or chapter. Once you've identified those chapters that do apply to your agency, the next thing you're going to do is then go back through again and look specifically at those applicable chapters to determine, do you already have what the practice is asking for? Is the practice asking for a policy and you have it? Good. Pull out that policy and be prepared to take a look at it and make sure when was the last time you reviewed it. Is that policy still in place? The same thing for your procedures. When you're looking and the practice is asking for a procedure, do you have a written procedure? You may very well say, well, sure, we have a procedure. This is what we do. Is it written down? If it's not, then you're going to need to determine how, what needs to be put in writing for that procedure. That's where the long-term prioritization comes into play. You've identified the practices that you know are your responsibility. You've identified the practices that you have existing policies and procedures written down. And you've identified the practices where you know you do it, you know what the policy is, but it's not documented. Three different areas there. Those areas where you are actually having to create a new policy or a procedure are typically what could take you the longest. Again, I want to remind you, though, keep it simple. Do not get hung up on tremendous detail. Don't think you have to write a book for your policy. Make it short and make it to the point so that anybody will understand what it is you are trying to explain. Make it clear. You're also going to be then assigning chapters to your staff. This is a team effort. One person cannot do it all. I know I've said that before, and I will say it again, though. It's a team effort. So as whether it's your director or your accreditation manager, whomever it may be, is reviewing and recognizing that this chapter is our responsibility, we're going to assign it to the appropriate supervisor or the appropriate field person. Maybe it's an admin support. Those assignments will be made to the correct staff so that the staff can then move forward and begin their improvement process. The same staff will be looking at those practices and determining whether the information is current or outdated or needs to be created from fresh. Set the time frame for when you want the chapter reviews completed. It's important to have those deadlines. Again, people are procrastinators. We want to make sure that they have a focal point. It's also important to make sure that you, as a group, get together, maybe on a monthly basis, and talk about the progress that you're making. This is a good time to talk about any troubles or problems that you're experiencing. Get the feedback from other people so that you'll know, one, you're not alone, and two, hear the ideas coming in from everybody else. All right. Thank you, Tracy. And I just wanted to interject for a moment to say we're, we've been getting in a lot of good questions. And... Uh, 
seems like we've answered quite a number of them just through the, the course of the uh, uh, presentation so far, and some of those may be answered uh, just in uh, the regular presentation coming up. In addition, we will have a question and answer period at, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so if you haven't had an answer to your question yet as of those time, uh, at that time, feel free to reiterate it if you've already put one in and it hasn't been answered. Uh, I will go ahead and, and uh, we've got a new one here I'm going to answer while Tracy uh, takes a, a break on her voice for a second. Jeff asks, our community is currently progressing through a town-wide facilities master plan review. How important are facility conditions in achieving accreditation? And I think my answer to that would be that accreditation is all about uh, uh, processes and why and how you do things uh, and are you doing them. We don't come in and, and grade you on the results of what you do. It's more do, are you doing the right things and for instance, if you have a, a pavement condition uh, index program in your town and your governing body has determined that they're willing to settle for uh, a level of service of D uh, throughout the city, we're not going to come in and say, no, you need to be a, a B, uh, or no, all of your buildings have to uh, have uh, a modern uh, updated uh, air conditioning refrigerant. That's not our responsibility. It's more of how do I keep track of those things? How do I make sure they're updated uh, when they're supposed to be? So, and and now I'll turn it back over to Tracy, but again, keep those questions coming. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Yes, I was getting a little scratchy there for a minute. Another question that's come across from Stacy: is there an additional cost for the site visit? Yes, ma'am, there is. The cost associated with the site visit will involve um, APWA bringing in a team of evaluators for three days where we will be talking with all of your staff, reviewing your chapters for the that you went through for the self-assessment, we'll be touring your city, we'll be asking a lot of questions. I always tell agencies that when they start thinking about how much do they need to budget for the site visit. So your agency will be responsible for reimbursing APWA for the cost of travel and expenses associated with that site visit. On an average, we suggest that you budget about $5,000 for the site visit. It will be a team of four people coming in. This Again, this is for your accreditation, your first time site visit. Four people coming in, three evaluators and a staff person. And we will also be there for three nights. Um, we'll fly in. We don't bring anybody from your same state. The evaluator must come from a state, you know, not of yours. We want to avoid any possible conflict. And so this has been just been the best way to do it. We won't bring somebody, though. If you're on the West Coast, we're not going to bring somebody typically from the East Coast too much time traveling, and it can result in higher airfare also. When we're making our travel arrangements for the team, we try and be very cognizant of the cost. We want to make sure, you know, that we are not um, flying anybody. We don't fly anybody first class. We don't rent a private jet. You know, we're very cognizant of the cost and that it's your budgeting money. So let's go on and talk about tracking your progress through the self-assessment process. This is going to be utilizing the software. As I mentioned, the self-assessment software, you can purchase that online through the APWA bookstore. After you've made that purchase, this is what happens. We receive an email that tells us the purchase has been made. From there, a key code is then sent to your public works director for him to activate. The key code, once it's activated, then opens up the software where you can add users, you'll add anybody that's going to be working in the software, um, you'll add their email address with a password. Couple of, couple of helpful hints for you on the software. Uh, four years ago, Internet Explorer did an update that had a negative impact on the self-assessment software. 
We found that we were getting an increase in error messages that were occurring, including the software freezing up. We switched over to using it on Google Chrome and have experienced a tremendous decrease in error messages. So if you have available through your agency access to Google Chrome, I highly recommend that you use Google Chrome for the software. The software is housed on the APWA server, and it's available to you through an Internet uh, connection. It's just a simple website page that you go to. Um, you are given the link after the key code is activated. Again, everybody has their own login and password. Passwords should be a minimum of six characters and include one capitalized letter, one number, and a special character, such as an exclamation point or question mark. Please do not try to use a period or dash as a character. It will not recognize that or accept it, and you'll get an error message. The other thing is you have the option of uploading documents into the software. If you upload documents, each document cannot exceed 4 megabytes in size. There's no restriction on how many documents you upload. It's just that they cannot exceed that 4 megabytes. You also have the feature of adding hyperlinks. Hyperlinks are my new best friend. If you have information that is stored on your website, maybe it's out there on your, your organization's website referring to your code book. Maybe it has something to do with emergency procedures. Whatever it is, if it's on your website, I highly encourage that you utilize the hyperlinks feature. Just remember, though, if you are using a hyperlink and it's taking you to a document that is extensive, maybe it's your budget book, maybe it is your code book, make sure that the hyperlink goes to the particular page that pertains to what the practice is asking. It will do neither your new hire any good or an evaluator when we're on site for your site visit if you take the hyperlink just to the opening page and they have to try and find the information that they're looking for in relation to that practice. So make sure the hyperlink goes right to the page that's in question. The other thing is if you have um, information that's located on your local intranet drive, your local network drive, you can hyperlink to that also. It is only available to those that are logged into your system, but it's a great way of adding information. When you are working in your practices, and I'm going to show this to you here so that you have a better idea, this is what the self-assessment software looks like. Each page has the same layout. You'll see at the top of your page where there is listing the chapter name, the practice number, and the practice title. Below that, as Stephen talked about earlier, was the what the practice is asking for in blue font. This is the area, again, that you want to pay close attention to. In this particular practice, it's asking for what is the process that you've developed and followed a process for reviewing your organization's mission structure, operational capability, and services. So when is that done? Well, in most cases, it's done during the budget process. I see that from a lot of agencies. Everybody could be different, though. The, font, the content in black just gives you further description, helpful guide as to what you should be looking for in order to be in compliance with the practice. As you move down, looking in the software, this is a feature here, and although it, we can't operate it at this point, if you click on this drop-down arrow, it will give you an option of all the compliance levels that we talked about earlier. You can work using those compliance levels to help measure your progress in the practice. The second box, documentation and directives. Think of this as your table of content, your index. Any item that you are referring to to support your full compliance rating should be listed here. You can add whether it's through exhibits and documents that you're going to upload or whether it's information that's contained on your website. List it here. 
If you wish to add a hyperlink to it, all you have to do is highlight it and then click over to this icon here, which is a hyperlink manager. It will open up to a window where you can add your hyperlink. If you add a hyperlink, I suggest that you make sure your hyperlinks work. In order to do so, after you've created a hyperlink, click down here on Preview. The window will slightly change. At that point, you can go back up here and click on that hyperlink to make sure that it's functioning. Further, down here in the Agency Compliance box, this box is intended to serve as a brief statement, how is your agency compliant with the practice? In the same order, if your agency, if this is a practice that is not applicable or non-jurisdictional, this is where you'll make your statement, why does it not apply to your agency? So if you're a, a, um, an agency in Florida and you come across the chapter on snow and ice control, this most likely is going to be a non-applicable chapter. What are you going to put in your agency compliance box? Well, most likely a simple statement saying, you know, the weather is not conducive to snow and ice in our area. For those type of explanations, you really don't have to provide any supporting documentation. I can tell you, though, one city in Florida took it one step further, and they provided a 12-month graph showing how they had not received any snow or ice over the past 12 months um, based on weather.com. So it was pretty ingenious on that. They took it very seriously to show why it was not applicable to their agency. This whole self-assessment process on the software itself is very user friendly. We've worked hard over the course of the years to make sure that our users are finding it not too cumbersome and very conducive to anything that you want to copy and paste in. With that being said though, as you are working in these two boxes, the documentation and directives and agency compliance, it will allow you to copy and paste items from Word documents with no problem. If you try and copy something from an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't like it too much, and you'll find that you won't have lined up boxes and your cells will be all over the place. The other thing, you can upload as attachments, as a file, PDFs and images and those Excel documents. They will appear down here at the bottom under files. There's no limit as to how many documents you can upload. Again, the only limit is on the size of the document, not to exceed 4 megabytes. The most valuable point that I want to make to you, this is a lesson learned by many agencies out there. As you are working in the self-assessment, please remember to click on Save. And you can find the Save button further down below the screen. It's not showing here, though, now. You'll have an option of save, delete, printer, printer friendly, and notes. So as you're working in it, if I was, if I was the person developing up here in documentation and directives, after I've entered all this information, I would be sure to come down here and click save. Or maybe as I'm working through this agency compliance statement, be sure to click save. Just like your agency, your organization, and your IT department, occasionally your servers go down with no notice, we have the same problem here occasionally at APWA. Maybe there's a power outage. Please, I just urge you, click Save frequently. When I get that phone call that says, Tracy, I got up and went to lunch and came back and I was logged out and all my work was gone, the first thing I'm going to say is, did you hit save? And when you tell me no, unfortunately, I'm going to have to be the bearer of bad news and say, I'm sorry, I cannot recover your information unless you had saved it. I hate it when that happens, but it has happened, unfortunately. So let's move on. When you're putting together your policies and procedures and you're preparing your supporting documentation, if you have a lengthy document, what you want to do is be sure to highlight the area in that document that pertains to the practice. In this case, as shown by Marilyn Heights, 
here in Missouri, what they've done is they had a page from their procedures, and they went ahead and just highlighted the area in question that pertained directly to the procedure. So this way, whether it's an employee or an evaluator, a council member or city manager, whoever is reading the practice, they are able to go right to the supporting documentation and see what the answer is to the practice. One thing I want to mention, if the practice is asking for a procedure, be sure that you show a procedure, but also show how you have implemented that procedure. That could be in terms of, it talks about there's a practice on what type of safety training do you perform, or you should be performing safety training. So your procedure is your policy. You've got a policy in place. Yes, we do safety training. Your procedure on it is that you conduct a safety training, you know, maybe once a quarter. What you need to show also then would be an example is a sign-in sheet showing your staff has attended a scheduled safety training. Maybe it's an agenda. Maybe it's an email saying we are holding this training on such and such a date. Whatever can back up your claim that yes, you are doing safety training. I hope that's clear for you. Please let me know if you need any suggestions for further supporting documentation. As we move forward, we're going to talk about the accreditation process, but first I see that we've got a couple of new questions coming in. How do you find out if your organization has used the self-assessment program? Okay, the first thing that you need to do is reach out to Stephen or I after the call, and we can look up your agency in the software, and we'll check first to see if you're in the software. We can also see if you're currently under contract to work to become accredited. If we don't find neither, then it's possible that your agency is just in the beginning stages and thinking about it and determining when is the right time for them in the self-assessment process. So we look forward to having that conversation with you. The other question, what would be overall short and long-term cost to an agency to participate in the program? Wow, that's a good question. A little challenging, and it can have a wide variety of answers. Remember that every agency's cost will be different. Again, based on your application fee, you know, it can just really vary. It's I don't have a statistical number for you on that. I would say, again, though, the average that we're looking at is between twelve and $15,000 on the accreditation fees alone. And keep in mind, a standard number that we tell agencies to budget for for the self-assessment site visit is about $5,000, and that's on the high end. Thanks for your questions, though. Keep them coming in. Now, let's talk about the accreditation process. Purpose of accreditation. Well, we want to help you. You've done the work. You've completed the self-assessment process. Now it's time to take the final step, and that's to go through accreditation to get that recognition that you deserve for having a well-run operation, a well-managed public works agency. Accreditation is going to demonstrate, because you've completed that self-assessment, you've reviewed your policies and procedures, everything is no older than three years old, or if it is, it's been reviewed within the last three years, you're well-managed. You have now gone from being reactive to being a proactive agency. How many of you want to be able to say that? It is a goal, I believe, for every public works agency to be better, to be pro proactive instead of always being reactive. The agency also, you, you've reviewed the management practices against those best management practices. Remember, our manual, all of those practices, the 609 practices were reviewed, developed, created by, by your peers by other public works professionals. So these were not just made up random questions. They are out there, put together by people you likely know. Accreditation also, most important, demonstrates that your agency is continued, is, is dedicated to continuous improvement. You recognize the value 
in making sure that what you're doing is current and efficient. You can't do much better for your community than being able to reassure them of that fact. Completing the self-assessment process, submitting your application and the agreement, setting the timeline for when you want to have the self-assessment process completed and ready for your site visit, and holding those scheduled, regular scheduled meetings. Those are all huge milestones to make sure that you hit. It's a team effort. You don't do it alone, but making sure that these tasks are all met will ensure your success in the self-assessment process leading you to become accredited. This is a template for the accreditation agreement. It's a six, seven page, five, five, six, seven page document, I believe. Every agency applying for accreditation must complete the agreement. It spells out in here the purpose, the agency, your responsibility, APWA's responsibility. With the completion of the application and the agreement, we also require at the time of submittal that you provide a letter of commitment from your city manager, from your town administrator, maybe your county administrator, that person that oversees the overall organization. It's important that we know that they know you're taking on this commitment. With the, app, with the agreement, you're also going to complete this application. Remember I mentioned that the application is where you will be able to determine the cost of your accreditation fees. One note for you, in order to apply for accreditation, an agency must have at least two staff persons one of them being your director, they must be a member of APWA. In most cases, it's always your director and typically the person assigned as the accreditation manager. Doesn't necessarily have to be though, but you do, you are required to have two staff be members of APWA. This is the first page of the accreditation application. The second page is where you are going to determine what your fees are. In this Top portion right here, it's reflecting chapters 1 through 40, which is the 8th edition. The area up here in black is for chapters 1 through 9. Those are mandatory for every agency going through accreditation. Chapters 10 through 40, this is where you're going to indicate by each chapter whether it applies to your agency or is it not applicable. If it is not applicable, we do request that you indicate why so over in this far right hand column. You take the number of those agency of those chapters that are applicable, the number that are that are not applicable and are applicable. Sorry about that. You take that number from here and add it down here in part B. Go to part A and you're going to see over here on the right hand side a list of what the population fees are. So based on what your population is, you'll check the mark and the cost comes over here to the side. Bring that total down here. Remember those nine mandatory chapters? The flat fee of $800 for those first nine chapters. Then you've got your number of applicable chapters here. Multiply it times $200. Add this box, the $800 and the $200 per chapter here, and that will give you your total accreditation fees. Accreditation fees, not reaccreditation. When you are going through reaccreditation, you will complete a similar application. Again, going through and looking to see what chapters are you responsible for. A lot of times what we see agencies every four years when we come around for reaccreditation is they've gone through some type of agency or organizational reorg. And it can impact the chapters that are your responsibility. So the number of chapters may increase, but it may also decrease, and it can, it can impact what your chapter responsibility is. When you are applying for reaccreditation, you will go through the same formula preparation and then calculate what your fee is, but down here you'll take your total fee, multiply it by 50% and that'll give you your reaccreditation fee. 
When you submit your application and agreement into APWA and your letter of support from your administrator, please be sure to submit two original or two original agreements. That way on our end, we will maintain one fully signed agreement and one fully signed agreement will be back, mailed back to your agency. So at this point, you've submitted your application, which again, remember, you can put your application in at any time. It can be at the very beginning when you're starting the self-assessment, or it can be halfway through. It can even be at the end, right before you're ready for your site visit. Your application and agreement do need to be submitted, though, to APWA at least 90 days prior to when you want to have your site visit. We need to allow for sufficient time to process the paperwork also on our end and start communication with you to get ready for that site visit. As you're ready, getting ready for your site visit, what's going to happen is this. Your paperwork will be submitted to APWA. You're going to contact either myself or Stephen to set your site visit date. You're going to need a, a total of we're looking at four days for accreditation. That includes one day to travel in, two and a half days for review, and then on that fourth afternoon is when the team will exit and head back home. As our responsibility here with APWA, we're going to take you through this step by step. At no point ever are you in this alone. Let me reassure you that Stephen and I are here to help you get through the process we're not going to do the work for you, but we will certainly be here to talk you off the ledge, answer any of your questions that you have, and even provide you with examples. So as you're preparing for your accreditation site visit, you're also going to want to pick your staff that will be reviewing chapters with the evaluators. That being said, a schedule will be prepared by us here, laying out what will happen each day which evaluators will be reviewing chapters with your staff will spell it out. There won't be any question as to what's going to happen when. We ask that the agency arrange for hotel rooms and provide and set up for direct billing. The reason for that is it provides a cost savings for you. If APWA was to pay for the hotel costs, we are not exempt in your state, tax exempt. So we would have to turn around and include taxes in the reimbursement for hotels to your agency. But if you make the arrangements set up for direct billing, you can have that cost savings with not having to pay tax. The other thing also is you know the area best. So we're going to ask that you make the hotel reservations. You're going to know the best location to put us in that's convenient to your office, that's convenient maybe to restaurants and just you, you're familiar with the area, so we want to pull on your expertise. When we come for your site visit, you're going to have a team of three evaluators. Again, remember, they will not be from anybody from your state. We'll be pulling from the surrounding regions. There'll be one staff person there. We're going to come in. We're going to review and validate all your policies and procedures that pertain to the practices that you are applicable for. You may find evaluators are asking a lot of questions. They will not hesitate to tell you, though, more important, they are there to steal your good ideas. That's the one thing I see evaluators make sure everybody understands. When they come in on a site visit, they're like, show me your good ideas. I want to take them back to my agency. Talk about a networking tool. You're going to also have that opportunity at the same time to ask the evaluators questions. You know, maybe an evaluator is from a similar region and you have similar challenges. It's a great opportunity for your staff to say, well, how do you handle this? What is it that you do? So you're sharing ideas. It's all about making sure that your processes that you are providing to your community are the best. If it means taking the idea from another community, by all means, do so. One thing you'll want to make sure is because we'll be bringing in three evaluators, it's important to make sure that each evaluator has a place to work. When Think about 
a group of three people, all very vocal, all, you know, having lots of questions to ask, but they're having three separate conversations with a group of people. It becomes very difficult to focus, so we ask that you have, you know, breakout rooms for each evaluator and for the staff person, and you should have computer access available also because they will be going in uh, to the software and reviewing your material that way. You're going to be looking at having making a presentation to the evaluators. These are people that are coming in that, for the most likely case, they have never been to your city before. Your presentation should be brief, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but talk about what it is that your responsibilities are within your agency. Talk about some statistical information for your organization. Give the evaluators an opportunity to gain a quick overview of what it is that you do. And then take us on a tour. Show us your facilities. Maybe you've got some unique projects going on. There's something, everybody has something different that they want to show off. Maybe you have a project that is completed or underway that has some unique characteristics to it. That's a great time to show them off. After your, after we cut back from the tour, we start the review. What you can expect from the evaluators is that as they're going through each practice, they will be very clear in telling you what rating they are giving your practice. They will tell you if they need to see additional information. They will be specific to that so that you're not just searching for any random type of documentation. And they will also tell you at the same time if a practice is in full or substantial compliance. After the site visit has taken place, on our last day there, when we make our exit report, you will know at that time whether the team will be recommending your agency for accreditation. From there, what happens is we come back. The Accreditation Council will receive a letter of recommendation from the team along with a ballot and your site visit results. That With that recommendation, the Council will vote to accredit your agency for the next four years. You'll receive an official notification, and then you get to celebrate. In addition to a letter of notification, you will receive two beautiful plaques that will indicate that your agency is accredited for four years, and it's, it's just beautiful. If you've ever have a chance to see what an agency has, see an agency that has one, you have to look at it. We will also here at APWA help you promote your success. We're going to do it through means of press releases. We will have someone from our board of directors come and formally present you with your plaques at a public meeting. We will put it out to our InfoNow community. We're going to share the press release with you so that you can share it with your local media. We really, after all this time you've put into it, we want to make sure that you, you know, get the attention that you so deserve. One thing prior to having your site visit, it's highly recommended that you have a peer review. Remember at the beginning we talked about the value in our evaluators and the people that come from our accredited agencies. By having that peer review prior to your site visit, you'll have a better understanding of what is expected. And it's a great opportunity for someone from the outside to come in and look at your work and see where you stand. They'll make suggestions to you. They're going to help you get, gain a better understanding of what actually occurs at a site visit. After you have achieved accreditation, every, two years later, you're going to be asked to submit a midterm report. This is for both accreditation and reaccreditation. This midterm report strictly is a focus on how are you doing on continuous improvement. Did you have any practices at your previous site visit that were in substantial compliance? Remember, accreditation cannot be awarded if you had practices that were below substantial compliance. So your midterm report wants to see, though, that you are making progress in bringing those substantial compliant practices up to full compliance. It also wants to know if you've experienced any reorganization within your agency or even your organization. 
This way it gives us a heads up that you may have been experiencing some major changes in staff and we'll want to reach out to you to see how we can help you. The big thing though is at this midterm report, this should be your alarm clock letting you know in two years we're going to be back there for reaccreditation and you're going to need to be ready. So at two year point midterm report, if you have not already started re reviewing your information again, this is the time to. You should have by now purchased the next manual and self-assessment software, conversion, and getting ready to update your information. A reaccreditation will occur every four years. So two years after that midterm report, we'll be looking to come back with a new team of evaluators and do it all over again. For reaccreditation, however, it does not require a 100% review of all of your applicable practices. Instead, what we do is a one-third random review of each applicable chapter's practices. Make sure when you're preparing for reaccreditation that you are reviewing your supporting documentation, your policies and procedures, your inventories, making sure that everything is reviewed at least once over the course of three years. Reaccreditation is not as intense and it's less time while we're there. Instead of three nights, it's two nights. Instead of three evaluators, it's two evaluators. It's at a much quicker pace. Accreditation of your agency, the question to ask yourself right now, why are you not accredited? Think about that. You are doing the job of, uh, you know, you're valuable to every age, to every community. You are the first in responders during an emergency. You're the person that police and fire call on when they need to get somewhere and a road is blocked. People's toilets flush because of what you're doing. You are vital to every community out there. You should be accredited. Go through the self-assessment process. Develop, redefine your policies and procedures. Do it as a team. As we finalize our presentation here today, just a couple of things to touch base on. How long will it take? On an average, 15 to 18 months, no more than three years. That includes being able to complete the self-assessment, make your changes, and request your site visit schedule. Anything longer than three years, we find that agencies lose interest, they've had a change in leadership, and it's had an impact on the process. Is accreditation mandatory? It is not. I wish, you know, I could say that it was, but it is not. This is a voluntary program. It's a program, though, that I strongly believe in that this can only benefit your agency and your organization. Yes, APWA membership is required. You have to have at least two public works employees. I, let me rephrase that. You have to have at least two employees, including your director, be members of APWA. Oftentimes agencies will ask the question, you know, maybe they get started in the self-assessment and they decide that they, they don't want to go forward with becoming accredited. It is allowed. If you only complete the self-assessment process and do not move forward to becoming accredited, what we will do is have a peer review. Through that re after that review, you will receive a certificate of completion of the self-assessment process. The APWA accreditation webpage is a wealth of information. Please feel free to go to APWA.net, click on Education and select Accreditation. There's information, there's resources there, including the forms that have been shown in this presentation contact information for agencies that are accredited and under, con and under contract, in addition to resource videos that may help you through the process. I want to thank everybody for your time with us today. On behalf of Stephen and I, we have enjoyed having this chance to talk all things self-assessment equaling accreditation. 
and we look forward to hearing from you all in the future. If you had questions that we did not get to, let's just take a look here and see if we missed anything. Let's see here. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Yes, we do actually have a number of uh, questions that have been submitted throughout uh, the uh, presentation, and we'll try to answer some of those for you now. Tracy and I will maybe tag team on these. Um, I have one here that says, uh, uh, the question asked is, how can I encourage my agency to participate? Who do I go to? And I guess the answer to that question would be, uh, if you have access to uh, your director or your superintendent, the, the decision makers, then that would be who I would go to. But if you're maybe a little further down the rung, I think I would start with your direct supervisor, indicate why uh, you think this is a good idea, tell them you know, where you saw this and how you think it will help your agency, and see if you can push it on up the ladder. Again, as we talked about during uh, earlier slides, it really requires uh, participation and support from, from the very top down to really truly be successful. To add to that, you might also, if you yourself are interested in the process, you might consider speaking to, you know, in asking your director to consider having a workshop. We will come to your agency and talk about all things of credit self-assessment and the reasoning why you should become a, complete the process and what it takes to be involved. This is a great opportunity for your director, for your council, your city manager, and all of your staff to hear about the process involved all at the same time, to hear the questions that are being asked. Another question we have is, how many Canadian agencies are accredited? We have two agencies in Canada that are accredited, and we have one agency currently under contract. Um, it's, it's not as popular there, but the interest is definitely there. Unfortunately, we don't have any agencies accredited in Alaska or Hawaii or Puerto Rico yet, but I'm always hopeful. All right, we have another question here. How long does the self-assessment normally take? Well, Again, that's one of those questions that every agency is different. On an average, we're seeing, I could say, up until two years ago, we were seeing about 18 to 20 months. Now we're seeing closer to 15 to 18 months. Recently, I've had, in the last year, I've had several agencies, though, that have completed it in just under a year. So everybody is different. I think the telling thing will be to determine at the very beginning Make that determination of when do you want to complete it by. You can be aggressive or you can take a more slow and steady approach to it. We have a question of looking for more detail, what's expected in the written procedures. When you're writing your procedures, it's important to make sure that you and anybody else looking at them will be able to understand. I'm not talking about when, you're, when your procedure is for a vehicle inspection before you take off in it for the day. Does that detail include go and pick up the keys, walk out to the parking lot? It doesn't involve, doesn't necessarily need that much detail. What they're wanting you to focus on are what's the reason for this walk around? What are you looking for? Does it mean that you need to indicate in your procedure, make sure you have the checklist? Probably a good idea. Otherwise, why do a walk around? What forms are you using when you're doing these walk arounds? So think of it in terms of that person that's new. Are they going to understand what it is they need to do when they read this procedure? That's the best example I can give you in terms of what to, what to include in your procedures. If you think that it's got enough information in it, show it to somebody that maybe doesn't know that procedure. That's a good way of judging, are they able to understand what has to be done? 
Another question, is there an advantage to receiving additional funding from federal, state, or regional? I am not sure on your question if you're referring to funding to cover for the cost of the accreditation, or are you talking about, it's possible I hope you're referring to, can this help you with obtaining future funding for projects? That is not something in the past that we've had consistent measurement on. I have heard, though, in particular from agencies located in California and Colorado and Washington that they are seeing a drastic reduction in their insurance premiums because they are from accredited agencies. It is a, something that we want to do a better job of here at APWA in measuring to be able in the future to give you um, more detailed statistics. If there was something on that question that I've misunderstood, please reach out to us after the conference call so that after this call so that we can uh, properly address your question. For agencies, here's a question. If policies are over three years old, how do you prove that they've been reviewed? If you are using a template, however you're using it, and you've got an existing policy or procedure, um, you can simply use a stamp, however it is, type it in that it's been reviewed and the date when. And it's always good to also include the name of the person that reviewed it. Whatever you want to do. I have some agencies that have been very creative in developing templates that at the bottom of the document, they've actually included a box that has multiple lines for multiple review dates so that every three years when they're going in and looking at it, they're indicating right in that template that the policy or procedure has been reviewed with the date and by whom. If you're interested in seeing a template such as that, please send us an email and we'll be happy to provide one to you. Are there any documented proof of benefits of this program? Well, as I was saying, the, the biggest, not so much documented that we maintain here in APWA. However, we have heard over the course of the year since the program first began, um, we hear from a lot of agencies, you know, one was the insurance premium reductions. Other agencies have conveyed to us that they're able to um, get items approved through their budget because they've been able to tie it into being a requirement. Uh, through the through the self-assessment process. An example would be um, one of the suggestions that was made to an agency by an evaluator was that they purchase a um, software for work orders. They were currently going old school and writing everything down on paper. So the director included in their upcoming budget a request to purchase software as, re as suggested by the accreditation evaluator. Their council, because they saw that it was a recommendation that came from an evaluator, approved it. Since then, every time they've asked for a special item in their budget, they've been able to tie it to their accreditation. The items have been approved. Very similar to what we see happens often with our police and fire departments. We all know that, you know, every year they're always asking for new vehicles, new equipment, and it's very seldom that they are denied because they tie it to safety. Public works professionals need to do a better job in justifying why they need the same type of tools in order to do their jobs. Hopefully, completing the self-assessment process and becoming accredited will help make that easier for you. Question that we have is, is there a role for a consultant to public works agencies to encourage and support APWA accreditation? Well. I'd like to think that that's what Stephen and I are here for. We work with agencies at all phases of the process, whether it's just from the beginning like now and you're interested in it, you're considering it, all the way through the end to after you've achieved accreditation and then working forward to reaccreditation. That's why we're here. We want to encourage everybody. We provide you support as you're working through the self-assessment process. If you've got questions, maybe you need to see an example of what an, another agency has done in order to develop your own policy. We maintain what's called a library of model practices. With those model practices, they are selected from agencies 
that have achieved accreditation, they were picked by evaluators. Those model practices can be shared with agencies such as yourselves going through the process, not to duplicate, but to get ideas of how to begin. Question we have, is there a cost to have a workshop done? Yes, ma'am, there is. The current cost for a workshop is $800 plus the reimbursement for the travel expenses uh, for me to come and do a workshop. It's approximately a five and a half hour process. I'll travel to your agency, spend the day with your staff talking about the self-assessment. We'll go through uh, practices and do exercises on it. I'll answer your questions. It's a wonderful time for everybody to hear all the information at the same time. One last question. How many total agencies have been accredited? Currently, we have 128 agencies across North America, and we have 33 agencies under contract. I'm anticipating by the end of this year, this calendar year, we will be at 134. So the program is rapidly growing. I hope that all of you will consider this. Please reach out to Stephen or I if you have further questions. And thank you for your time today. Stephen? Thank you, Tracy. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, if there are additional questions, we invite you to uh, contact either Tracy or myself uh, here at APWA. And uh, our contact information is available on the website. Please don't forget to fill out the evaluation form. The link to the survey is listed on your program instructions. And again, this program is worth 0.2 continuing education credits. To request CEUs, participants must complete the survey. So if you're looking to keep your license going, make sure to get that done. CEUs for the Click, Listen, and Learn programs are typically processed within 10 business days, after which you will receive an automated email to let you know when your transcript has been updated and instructions on how to log on and access your updated transcript. And again, a recording of today's program will be available in the APWA Members Library within one week. And APWA members can log into the library to access past Click, Listen, and Learns and conference content free of charge. Please join us after today's program to continue the conversation through Accreditation Council Info Now community on APWA Connect. Instructions on accessing the Connect communities are available in the files pod at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for your attendance and participation during this program. Have a great day.